Hi everyone, this is Simon and Acti Movie Reviews, episode 90. And uh, I'm Acti, I'm from Turkey, and I'm here with my beautiful husband, handsome, sexy husband. Say hi, boo. Hey, 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 what's up everybody? My name is Simon, I'm from Louisiana, and uh, we're here to review this film, The Eyes of My Mother, a 2016 horror film that we watched about a week ago. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um... Okay, you're better at this. All right, all right. <laughs> Don't put me in the spot now. No problem, no problem. But anyway, shout out to Women Slayer for joining in. And uh, we do these re movie reviews quite often, but I've been sick uh, this past month in October, so that's why we took a little break. But we've been watching films. We've been watching series. We have a lot that we actually want to talk about. But uh, going to this film, this is one that we uh, really enjoyed. I think I enjoyed it, at least. But um, it's a... It's a film by a new director. He's Brazilian American. I believe his name is Nicholas Peche. Nicholas Peche, and uh, this was his first film that came out in 2016, a black and white horror film about a young girl who is the daughter of immigrants who live out in the forest somewhere in America, and she has an obsession with the human body, especially the eyes, because her mother was an optometrist. And she goes through a horrible experience with her family and then ends up becoming a horrible person herself. And uh, like I said, I enjoyed it when we watched it a few weeks ago. How did you feel after we saw it? Yeah, I enjoyed it, too. I For me, it wasn't like, oh, wow, like it's so deep or whatever. But it was still very enjoyable. And it's like a short movie. I think it's like one hour, 16 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, it was like that. I don't know. It was like a light, but still makes you think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But it wasn't like super original. Right. It w it's not original as a horror film in that you see something you've never seen before. Because I think we've all seen films with uh, people getting kidnapped locked in a basement, horrific, uh, brutal murders and stuff like that. So it does everything that you've seen before, but it does it well, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Like the cinematography and the story was good. Like I wasn't bored watching this movie. Uh, it's just that, I don't know. I feel like lately I've seen so many sort of kidnapped, stuck, serial killer type of movies. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just like the stuff I'm watching, but yeah, um, it just didn't feel like that different for me. But I think it's a good debut if this is like the first time uh, of the director. Yeah, like for Nicholas to like make his portfolio of films, like if this is going to be his debut, it's like a really good mixtape. Like on his mixtape, he shows he can really rap. He shows he can <laughs> pick good beats. He shows he got different flows. So it's like a good debut. You know what I'm saying? A solid first album. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Though I wish, like, there was one thing uh, as I was watching the movie. So the movie is, like, half Portuguese, half English, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I get in the sense that they're, like, trying to make us understand that they're possibly living in America, but they're, like, from per Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, but or Brazil. They could be Brazilian. Or Brazil. Like, they, they are from somewhere who speaks Portuguese. And, uh, yeah, the thing is, like, at some parts, it didn't make sense that language change for me. Uh, okay. So I wish it was, like, fully Portuguese or fully English. Actually, I like that they switch from English to Portuguese sometimes in this film because I have a theory about this film. And my take on this film is that this is an immigrant horror story told from both angles. The horror that happens to immigrants when they come to America and also the horror that immigrants can do to Americans. That might be a hot take, but we're living in the Trump era now, so I can say that. These goddamn immigrants, they come to our country and they come and hurt our people, but also <laughs> <laughs> the immigrants come and they pick up on the worst stuff that we do as Americans. And I'm going to build on that more when we tell the story. But that's the take that I had when I started meditating and thinking about this film more, because there are some things that happen in here that seem off, unless you look at it through the lens of these being immigrants. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, it's a bit of a reach, but I understand. And I think you can, like, make that sense from this movie. All right. So it's a good take. It's a good take. From, like, 
what I got, like, especially second time watching it and trying to think back, the, like, the themes of it, it was more like, you know, um, unresolved trauma, PTSD, and how that, like, turned into something monstrous. If that right. Makes sense. Right, right. Um, let's break down this story. Let's talk about it more because I think you'll see that I'm not reaching. Right. When I start breaking it down. But I'd also like to hear your take on this as a psychological horror film, because this film is a horror movie, not in the sense there's jump scares, but it's like it works on your mind. And it's also like you can't believe the pain that's happening to people like in Martyrs or like in uh, Nymphomaniac 2, which is the scariest movie of all time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, from the description of this film that I was able to generate and we'll just break it down act by act. So we have act one, act two, act three in this film, but let's first start with the synopsis. So the eyes of my mother mother is a 2016 uh, film. It is a dark unsettling horror movie directed by Nicholas Peche. This black and white psychological horror dives into the disturbed life of a young woman named Francisca whose traumatic childhood leaves her with an obsessive and morbid fascination with death and anatomy. The story unfolds in three acts, each revealing deep layers of Francisca's psyche and her descent into isolation and madness. So uh, the first thing that we see in this film is like this truck driver driving in like the backwoods of America or something like that. And he stops like in the road because there's this woman that we see from far away. We don't know exactly who it is. And uh, she just drops dead like in the middle of the road or at least we think she's dead and there's this really cool aerial shot of like the truck driver getting out rushing over to her body and then like rushing back to his truck possibly to call for help and um i didn't know who that was and uh it was a great way of opening the film in my opinion but what did you think of that first shot yeah i liked the cinematography in the first shot as well because like we see that, yeah, there's like someone there, but it's not really like a close up. So we don't know if it's like a woman, if it's a man, but we definitely know like that person possibly is like has been tortured or something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. right off the bat, I was like, oh, shit, like we're going to see some torture scenes yeah, in this yeah. movie and it's going to be like brutal. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely gives you a sense of like curiosity. Yeah. In this film, there are slight hints to also religious uh, torture, right? Because uh, they do show like pictures of or statues of like Jesus with the crown of thorns. And uh, in the house, there's like, if you look in the background, like crosses and crucifixes hanging on the wall with like Jesus bloodied on them. And uh, it's hard for me not to try to draw some like parallels in this film with what happens to some of the people with the suffering that Jesus went through, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I can see that. I mean, honestly, I didn't really pay attention to the like religious emblems in the movie. Mm -hmm. It didn't really like struck me as I was watching it both times. Well, so, well, yeah, but well, I just I just thought that's like part of like, you know, wherever they're from, Brazil or Portugal, it is like a very Christian nation. Uh -huh. So I thought it's kind of part of that. Well, you're going to hate me later when I make the final point that Francisca is the Virgin Mary. She's <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you're going to you're really not going to like where I'm running with this. But let's talk about act one. So the film goes and shows a black a black screen with the text act one and it's titled Mother. So the movie begins with young Francisca living with her Portuguese immigrant parents in a secluded farmhouse in rural America. Her mother, a former surgeon, teaches Francisca about anatomy and life's impermanence, often explaining the procedures on dead farm animals. This early exposure to death becomes a foundation for Francisca's view of life and death. One day, a stranger named Charlie arrives under the pretense of needing help, but soon reveals his sinister intentions. He brutally murders Francisca's mother in front of her, traumatizing the young girl and forever marking her life. Her father captures Charlie before he can leave and instead of killing him, locks him in the family barn. Francisca's response to her mother's death and her father's strange mercy toward Charlie is chillingly calm and detached. 
She starts visiting Charlie in the barn, tending to his wounds, and eventually blinding and mutilating him to keep him as a prisoner. He becomes her first experiment as she channels the surgical skills her mother taught her, leaving him alive but helplessly dependent on her. This dynamic forms a perverse bond between the two, with Francisca gaining a twisted sense of control and company from his presence. So that generally summarizes Act 1. There's more to it. There's layers to the scenes. But what did you think about the first section of this film, which I think is about 25, 30 minutes or so? What did you think? Yeah, it was it was very nice, like uh, how they showed Francesca and her mom uh, and sort of like it was like a bit eerie. Like they ha they had the scene where there's a big <coughs> cow head on the table and they're like, you know, making cuts to it, and Francesca's mother is like, uh, gouges out its eye, mm. and like gives it to Francesca and says like, this is like everything we see goes through this lens, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like she's teaching her biology, right? So mm -hmm. it's a bit eerie, but at the same time, it's like kind of cute, <laughs> mm -hmm. like you're, you know, she's like sort of teaching her profession to her daughter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can see, like, okay, that like she truly loves her mom, and she's like very interested in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then in the background, her dad is just sort of like a ghost around the house. It yeah. seems like so there isn't like much of you know uh, interaction with him. Yeah, yeah. The dad was basically like just like I'm home, crack a beer, sit on the couch, watch TV till I fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, he didn't even say anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, like the way it starts off, uh, I don't know. But first, what did you think of the mother? So I thought the mother was okay. Uh, I really liked the acting uh, from her. And she has a very distinct look. It's an older woman. I want to get the name of her, but I can't find it right now. Uh, oh, her name is Diana Agostini. I want to give her praise for her performance because she has this very gaunt, haunted looking face. And she's like one of those characters who looks scary just by looking at her. But she's actually not scary. She's actually a good mom, right? Maybe a bit too trusting, though, because the way she let Charlie in the house, uh, I don't think, you know, people nowadays would do that. But maybe this movie was meant to take place in, like, 1980 or something. <laughs> so Yeah, but if you think about, like, I'm going to uh, go on to your take. If we're, like, doing the immigrant situation in this movie, then it's also, like, you know, whenever someone from a third world country goes to a more uh, developed country, uh, they assume that everything is safer. Mm -hmm. Like I had that, you know, when I came here or Europe, I was feeling like, oh, okay, like I can walk anytime I want outside, wear mm -hmm. whatever, you know, and no one is going to try to do anything to me. Like I'm not going to be as scared as I am in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And to a level it's true, but like I still get catcalled. I yeah. still don't want to wear certain things because people still give me looks. Mm -hmm. So it's not like completely true. So maybe it was that. Right. Well, let me run with the take then on the immigrant stuff, because that's where I really broke this. Well, that's where I, this is where I started thinking about it in act one. So in the beginning, we see that they're living like in a little house on the prairie out in the middle of nowhere. Now, who are the type of people that usually live in those very, very remote places? Those are people who really are farmers or people who want to be off the grid, like they don't want to be found. So my theory is that this family is either illegal immigrants, right? So they that's why they, you know, instead of killing Charlie, they sort of just keep him hidden. And that's why also when the mother is killed, the father says, hey, help me bury mom in the backyard. Like they don't want to be found. They don't want to report that they're in the country illegally. Or secondly, back in Portugal or Brazil, this guy and his wife could have been like a part of a dictatorship or some old regime that got kicked out of power. And now they're running for their lives and stuff like that, because Brazil and Portugal had like fascist governments back in the day that were eventually overturned. You get what I'm saying? So my, that's my theory about why the father is maybe a bit quiet and reserved and like he's just like, I just don't want to be bothered because I got a lot on my mind. And that's why they live far away in this distant, remote place in America where almost nobody can find them. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do you think father was also an immigrant or was he American? I think he was a, he was an immigrant, too, because there's a scene 
after they kill Charlie, right? Francisca and her dad, they're bonding by dancing in the living room to Portuguese music. Okay, I mean, they never really clarify it, but I will also assume, like, he's an immigrant as well. Yes, I assume he's an immigrant as well, and uh, he's basically trying to be as Americanized as possible and fly under the radar in a lot of ways, which is why he comes home, cracks a beer, sits on the couch, and watches, you know, Matlock or John Wayne movies until he falls asleep. You know what I'm saying? He's just trying, yeah. to, <laughs> he's trying to be as John Doe as possible. That's my theory. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it could be true because considering her mom was like a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. Why would they be like doing farming? Yes. <laughs> That's like, like, why isn't she still working? Or maybe possibly like his father could be doing something related to medicine or medical things. Yeah. So they're probably like now trying to live by, you know, doing farming things. Yes. Or raising animals. But yeah, that is very possible that they're like illegally there. And that would explain a lot of her father's actions. Right. They're either illegally there or wanted by people who might really, you know, fuck them up if they know where they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so another thing I want to say is like, um, you know, when, uh, when, Francisca is sitting outside, you know, playing with her dolls. And then Charlie comes. Charlie is probably most likely, you know, a real American boy, like good old American guy. Right. At least that's how he presents. And what I think Charlie represents is sort of like the violence in our country, how it can come to you almost anywhere. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to bring our personal discussions into our public discussions, but like we have these discussions sometimes in the house you know, about where are we going to live, where are we going to go, where are we going to build our family. And, you know, I'm adamantly against us going to the States because of violence like what we saw in this film. You can be in a remote place, you can be in the urban center, you can be anywhere, and it can come to you. And uh, literally, Charlie brought it to their door, he knocked on the door, brought the girl inside, put a gun in her mother's face, and basically started sawing her body in the bathtub. Like, that's not an unheard of story in the U.S., in my opinion. And I think, you know, how it plays out in this film, Francisca and the family are supposed to represent the immigrants who are coming to America, trying to build this new life and be in a better place. And they get met with this brutal violence. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And like, we've had, like you said, we've had these discussions and I agree with you. Like, I have no plans in like, about, you know, um, moving to America also because of the violence, especially gun violence, because it's scary. Like, if you think about it, I constantly see it on the news, uh, like a bunch of shootings or because people have so, you know, close access to guns, it's much more easier. And I think also, like, when it comes to serial killers, I think America has the most. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like, of course, other countries has them as well, but it's sort of like maybe because of Hollywood or something else, it's been kind of more popularized by America. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that might be also like some phenomenon that the director, you know, might discover. Yes, yes. So I just want to give a little trivia about this film. So the director, Nicholas Pesce, drew inspiration from a blend of classic horror and psychological thrillers, as well as real life serial killers. He was particularly influenced by the visual and thematic style of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, which a lot of people don't know was based on a real murder that happened. Like so one of the most famous horror movies that happened is really based on somebody running around with a chainsaw chasing very hot teenagers around. So <laughs> and uh, the black and white uh, cinematography of Ingmar Bergman's persona also inspired this film. So these influence contributed to the minimalist bleak and haunting atmosphere of the eyes of my mother. And the character of Francisca was loosely inspired by real life figures with twisted familiar obsessions, such as Ed Jean, the infamous killer known for creating art with human remains. Uh, Pesce sought to explore the horror of Francisca's psychological state by showing how her loneliness and emotional scars manifest into grotesque actions. Any comments on that? Yeah, I was just, uh, it's funny that you mentioned it was somewhat inspired by a real person. Because I was going to say, like, this could have happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it could be one of those, you know, stories 
um, that they make a documentary about. Really? Uh, because we do have like crazy stories. I did. I don't know the the person that you know um, it was inspired from. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we do have these like sort of crazy things that happen, especially in like rural areas right. where <laughs> people are very isolated. And honestly, like they seem super isolated. There's mm -hmm. like nothing nearby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a comment from Women's Flare, ironically, Women's Flare came in and said this. He said, serial killers are almost extinct in the 21st century America. Uh, there are still many serial killers running around, and it's not hard to find out about those type of people. I'm pulling up the information right now, but even if, let's say hypothetically, there were fewer serial killers now or zero serial killers in America, the level of gun violence in America still wouldn't make that any better. Uh, uh, the most recent uh, serial killer that I can find out uh, is a person, I believe her name is Heather, Heather Irene Presti. She's an American nurse and serial killer. She's uh, already known to have killed three people and her possible victims are 17. And uh, she was active from 2022 to 2023 and was only recently sentenced to life in prison. And I'll drop more links on uh, the serial killers in the chat, but let's not try to uh, mitigate America's violence, right? And by the way, for anybody who wants to know, California by far has had the most serial killers in American history with about 1,777. So just dropping those facts for y'all. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say like, yeah, serial killers are not like a lot of people because, yeah, a person can be psychopathic, but they don't necessarily have to take action on it. And they are like uh, very, you know, small amounts of serial killers, but there are still some, of course, mm -hmm. and they're not specific to like any nation. But I think what makes like America special in this position is once again, like the proximity to guns mm -hmm. and accessibility of it yeah, or like yeah. other, you know, this sort of things. Yeah. But uh, act one was uh, interesting in this film, just going back to the movie uh, because, uh, you know, the way they had Charlie tied up in the barn and, you know, Francisca is like sitting outside hearing him scream her name and stuff like that. I was thinking like, what's going through her mind? Like, how is she reconciling all of this? There weren't any tears in the film from Francisca for her mother, but there is also a scene uh, where her father is like in the bathtub, like breaking down a little bit. And uh, he seems like he's dealing with it emotionally hard. Uh, I wanted to know what you thought about that for those two characters. I mean, uh, like it said also, like in the, you know, summary that Francisca is somewhat used to death around her because yeah her mother like kills an animal and then they like inspect it together mm -hmm. like the head of it and i know of course it's not the same with your mother dying mm -hmm. but yeah when you're like uh, when you see death even death of animals around you it sort of like becomes a part of life which it is like yeah. death is part of life but it like becomes more normalized and i think for Frances francesca it was like shock plus that yeah like uh but also like a lot of shock as well but she mm -hmm. was like very small so maybe she wasn't able to grasp um you know the whole perspective no. of it while her dad was like more in the mourning process no i think uh she grasped it but i think what you said was uh good at first right like that uh francisca is just used to death she saw her mother kill animals all the time and she knew that death was probably a part of life so I, I wanted to know what you thought about the father, if he's a good man, because there's many times when Francisca says, like, I love you, daddy, or, you know, it's our dream to start a new life together. And um, the father never replies. He never does the, uh, you know, I love you, too, daughter, or confide in her or anything. Like, what do you think of him? Do you think he's a good guy? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say he's good or bad. He's just like very out of touch. He's very distant. It's like he's also... It feels like he's also struggling with himself and his own thoughts, not necessarily about like the death of his wife. Of course, that adds on to it. But I feel like even before that, maybe there was like he was like this still before that, you know, mm -hmm. he's I don't know, maybe like going back to the immigrant perspective, maybe like, you know, they came to this country. They've seen a lot of bad stuff in their own country. 
but they are still like struggling in this country that they were supposed to, you know, thrive in, yeah. uh, in a way, or maybe like he regrets coming here or, you know, whatever, but he, you know, he definitely had some problems of before, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah. But I think he's just like a very disturbed guy. No, I, yeah, he's disturbed and reserved. And uh, I think he's really hiding something. I think maybe the father was like that because maybe like the chickens are coming home to roost. Karma is coming back for his ass because they didn't say this in the movie, but I get the feeling he like tortured people back in his homeland. Wow. <laughs> like he caught a few bodies back home. Like he might have been like a brutal dictator, the son of a general that was tasked with like getting rid of all the communists in Brazil and something. Like he dropped people out of helicopters over the Atlantic Ocean and now he's like, fuck, I knew it would come back. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because like he was so desensitized to his wife's killing. Mm-hmm. And it's not like you know, she died of natural reasons or something. Like, there was a serial killer that killed her, and then he basically made his daughter clean the blood off of the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. And then said, like, come help me with your mother. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> that's the only thing he said. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he's desensitized to death, too, maybe, but maybe in another context. Not like yeah. seeing animals die, but maybe seeing other people die. But overall, I think the father is a good guy because he could have killed Charlie and would have had all the rights. Like we as the audience would have been like, yeah, do it. This guy just killed your wife in front of your daughter. Do it, do it. But he spares the guy's life. Now, once again, he could be doing that because he's like, I'm an immigrant. Me no want to get in trouble, papi. Me no trouble, papi. Or it could have been like, I'm, I don't want to kill anybody anymore or ever. Right. So just lock him up in the barn and let him starve to death. Right. Yeah, Maybe that's what he was planning. But uh I think overall he's a good guy and I think there are some um like overtones to like Jesus and God in representing of the father. Like cuz the father overall he was distant and cold, but he tried to take care of Francisca. He was uh forgiving and merciful to this man that killed his wife. So I think there could be a comparison that, you know, the father is like God and Francisca is Mary, but she's not Mary yet. But she's learning how to be a mother by taking care of Charlie in the barn. So then is the mother Jesus? Uh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll guess who Jesus is at the end as well. Okay. Okay. I'm still, I'm still building on it. Anyway, let's go to act two. So years pass and Francisca grows up isolated from the world with only her father and her prisoner, Charlie, for company. Her father dies of natural causes, leaving her completely alone. In her loneliness, Francisca maintains a daily routine, taking care of her father's corpse, still dressed and seated at the dinner table as if he were alive. She visits Charlie in the barn where his pleas for mercy go unheard. He, her warped sense of companionship and desire for a family take a darker turn when she meets Kimiko, a young woman she encounters in a bar. Francisca brings Kimiko uh, back to her house, and in a moment that reveals her desperate loneliness and confusion, she tries to befriend her. However, her perverse tendencies resurface, and she ultimately in- incapacitates and confines Kimiko, subjecting her to the same fate as Charlie. For Francisca, the act is not one of cruelty, but rather a desperate attempt to stave off the solitude that consumes her. So what did you think of part two? Yeah, I just want to say, like, the part when she's a little girl and, like, the guy they captured, the serial killer they captured, it's in the barn. And she's, like, she goes in with the guy and she's, like, cleaning his wounds and preparing her to be tortured, (laughs) him (laughs) to be tortured. Like, she asks, you know, why did you choose us? Like, why did you do this? And he doesn't really give her a solid answer. And then we have, like, these scenes of... Her and her father laying in bed, just Mm -hmm. silent. So it's like she's trying to make sense of all this as a little kid, but no one is telling her what is happening or what happened to his, her mom. I think, and I think that's her getting in cultured to America. Like that's what it is. Like why did the, why did you kill 
20 kids in a school? Why did you shoot random people at a party? Why, why does this happen in our country? And he's like, I don't know. It just, just feels good, man. Cause that's what Charlie says. He says, it just feels good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you, you, you don't even have to go that far. Like, why do you hate Muslims? Yeah. Or why do you hate like black people? Why do you think this and that of a certain group? And there's like, most of the time, there's either like a very silly reason behind it, or there's mm. like an untrue reason behind it. Or a denial that it even happens. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, but that was like very touching for me, you know, for her to like, yeah, she does this very bad thing to a serial killer. And mm. I don't know, like we can discuss the morality of it, but it's like in her heart, um, there is no like bad thing towards mm -hmm. him still because he says, are you going to kill me? And then she says, why would I kill you? <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is like obvious why you should kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, like, she's not really thinking in that level. And I think that continues until she meets the Asian girl. Yeah. And now just a little thing. The summary that I got for this film got part of it wrong. So Francisca did not kidnap Kamiko. What she does is, you know, she takes Kamiko home and she Kamiko is trying to hook up. She's trying to get some pussy. But <laughs> but Francisca doesn't understand sex, I guess, or lesbian sex. She's like, so what do we do? Do we like just rub together until we like we're just tired? And so, but yeah, like she ends up killing Kamiko and like chopping up her body and making it, you know, putting it in the fridge. And she still has Charlie in the uh, barn. And then she ends up taking Charlie out of the barn, washing him in the tub, and then she has sex with Charlie, as, as we assume. We don't see the sex scene, but she gets naked and shows that bush. And then later on, Charlie tries to run away after sleeping with Francisca, and then Francisca, like, kills Charlie in a very sexual stabbing scene. So that's really what happens at the end of Father Act Two. But any comments? Yeah, and, like, there are those scenes that also... Like, her father is dead, right? Mm. And she's, like, you know, putting her father around the house like it's normal while yeah. he's still dead. And, like, she goes and washes him, and he get, she gets in the tub with his dead body and, mm -hmm. like, hugs him and says, like, why did you go away? I miss you so much. Uh, why did you leave me alone? So we can see, like, her loneliness yeah. in this, like, strange country where something horrible happened to her. Mm. And she's like, she doesn't know what to do. And then, like, that's when she drives into the bar to find someone. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And we don't even know, like, if she was looking for a victim or anything. But mm -hmm. some girl just comes home with her. Yeah. Now, some that part of the film where she still keeps her father's body around, I was like, this is a little bit fantasy because the body is not, you know, uh, rotting at all. Right. And it made me think about that movie. Uh, like, I forgot what's the name X or Pearl, something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. X. Pearl. Yeah. Well, either one in that series, like they keep the bodies of the family there, but the bodies are like rotting away. But her father is still like, you know, there <laughs> alive. That doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's also like supposed to swell and things like that. Right. And mm. it's supposed to poop. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, but maybe it was still too early for that. Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe it was like the first couple of days that he's been dead. Yeah. Um, but also like, yeah, I don't know if they actually had sex, by the way, with the serial killer who's now like a mutilated, like animal sort of person. Oh. Uh, right. I'm not sure because I think he would be unable to do it in that yeah. state. Yeah. I mean, she ends up, you know, chopping up her father's body and then says, like, I can't be alone anymore. I can't be alone anymore. And then I think she ends up, like, sleeping with, uh, you know, uh, Charlie, right? And I think she drinks their blood. Oh, she drinks uh, the blood of Kamiko. Kamiko? Oh, that's Kamiko? Okay, well, that's yeah. strange. But I think that still includes some sort of, like, mm. a surgical, anatomical uh, curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. But uh I think, you know, with uh with everything that happened to her, like it sort of was like her becoming a woman 
because like, okay, you know, she, she violently rejects, you know, being a lesbian, but she does still have a fascination with the human body. And she's like chopping up stuff in remembrance of her mother. Right. So she chops up Kamiko, eats the body, you know, uh, finally buries her father because she like chops up the body of her father and burns it and then says, you know, I can't be alone. I can't be alone. And there was this scene where she's like, you know, dancing in the living room, listening to like Portuguese music. And she's doing like traditional Portuguese dance. And it's for, it was like, she's, she's now fully a woman, but she doesn't have uh, a partner or it doesn't have anybody around her to take care of her or show love to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think like, for example, her conversation with uh, Kamiko, uh-huh. it was like, she's, she was very alien. Like, she didn't know what was normal or not. Like, when... Okay, they start talking about her mom. And she, like, tells this sweet story of her mom. Like, how she was like and things like that. And then Kamiko asks, like, what happened to your mom? And, you know, Francisca says, somebody killed her. Mm. And then she asks, what happened to your dad? And then, like, Francisca says, I killed him. (laughs) And then it's, like, very... Like, she says it, like... Uh, you know, I ate rice yesterday, like, like that, yeah. just like that. And it was like so <laughs> normal for her. And then when she sees, uh, Kamiko's reaction, she says like, huh, that was a joke. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> and she doesn't have social skills. She's like the very socially awkward girl. Yeah. And yeah. if you go to once again, like the immigrant story mm. of it, right? If you have this. Uh, immigrant who went through something very tragic and now she's like uber alien in the society. Mm-hmm. She only knows like what her mom and her dad taught her mm-hmm. in terms of like traditions and I don't know, education, whatever. And now as she goes out into the world, like there are new freedoms, mm-hmm. like being lesbian, but there are also like some things that people won't understand. Mm-hmm. about you like in that sense if we're going into that headset yeah yeah it's like she's uh she has weird humor from the old world <laughs> <laughs> you know like uh yeah i think you know there could be a comparison made between like homeschool kids you know kids that never got to socialize at public school or private school mm-hmm. they only had their parents around them so that's like another thing that you could put on uh francisca like her weirdness and awkwardness never mind the um The fact she went through something traumatic. But let's talk about how she killed Charlie, right? So Charlie's trying to run away like, like Django. He's trying to run away like a, (laughs) like a slave trying to go to Canada. And then Francisca comes out there and basically, you know, stabs him, but in a very sexual way. It was a very, um, it's a very romantic murder, I would say. But what did you think of that scene? I, I don't know if it was like completely sexual. I would, say it more like there was a bond between them but i don't think it was romantic mm-hmm. uh it was more like a bond that you would have with your pet a little yeah, bit for like me. putting your dog to sleep yeah 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 because mm. uh and what was interesting that you know um when she remembered her childhood when she asked charlie you know why'd you do it and charlie said it just felt good Mm-hmm. And then she says, you were right. It just feels so good. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. So um, I think there was like a little bit of revenge in that mm-hmm. and relief, but also a lot of sadness because she was alone again. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, she was like, damn, Charlie kind of raised me. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, in a way, sort of like made her into who she is in a way, you know, because she was kind of maybe inspired by him. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because that wasn't the first time she killed. So she probably realized, oh, killing is actually good when she killed Kamiko. Who knows if she killed other people, right? Because how was she surviving all these years, you know, with her father getting older and then he dies? So maybe she could have been killing, robbing, and stealing this entire time. And uh, she realized, oh, shit, Charlie was right. It's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think she... Hmm... I don't know. Like she already, we know that she already enjoyed anatomical stuff Mm -hmm. and like, you know, sawing up people or animals. Uh, but at the same time, killing is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe. I mean, she did spend more time with Charlie than her mom. Yeah. Yeah. So shall we go to, uh, act three? 
Yeah. All right. So act three is titled family. So years later, Francisca grows even more despondent. She remains trapped in the farmhouse, now haunted by her memories and the ghosts of her twisted family. Driven by a desire for connection, Francisca uh, abducts a young woman and keeps her restrained as her new mother. She even kidnaps a baby boy, believing that this new family will fill the void within her. However, this attempt to forge human connections through forced captivity ultimately backfires. So... Okay, no, this is totally wrong. <laughs> this is totally wrong. I'm sorry. Chat GPT is absolutely trash. Listen, this is what happens in chapter three. <laughs> is it even titled family? <laughs> wow. Do you remember what it was titled? Yeah, it's titled family. Okay, listen. So one day, you know, Francisca is like standing on the road and she's like hitchhiking and she gets picked up by this woman in a pickup truck who has her newborn baby there. They stop by like a gas station and like I believe Francisca tries to like run off with the baby. But then, you know, the lady tries to run into the house to go after her baby and Francisca like knocks her upside the head. And the next thing the woman knows, she like wakes up in the barn and her eyes are gone and her throat is cut open and her maybe her tongue was taken out and she tries to scream for help but she can't because her tongue is gone and she can't see anything because her eyes are gouged out so that scene was very horrific what did you think about that when we saw that yeah i think that was like the first time i realized how horrible it would be if you're unable to scream Mm mm-hmm like when you need to scream. Yeah. Cause that sort of releases some energy, releases some anxiety. Mm-hmm. And because she couldn't do that, I felt so anxious mm-hmm. <laughs> in that scene. So scared because yeah, you can't ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was horrific to look at it. That's probably going to be the thumbnail because it's, yeah, a- it was. And also she made a sound like, <sighs> yeah. Like, and in, in when the we first see that the woman has no eyes, like, she starts crying, like, tears of blood. Like, there's a great, um, there's probably, like, an even better story that could be told uh, about, you know, this woman who had such something so horrific happen to her. Because she sort of becomes like a monster in this film. Does that make sense? Like, she's the thing in the barn that makes these weird noises and acts crazy but you don't know what it's saying. So she becomes a monster while Francisca can be seen as like the mother, right? Just from the perspective Mm. of like the little boy, right? Imagine the little boy grows up and all he knows is Francisca as his mom. And there's this weird thing in the barn that just hisses and howls, you know? Yeah, definitely. There could be a movie there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's a, there's a part three is definitely my favorite. You know, as far as the horror aspect of this, because the psychological part of imagining yourself as that mother, you know, your child is only a few feet away, but you're chained up and this woman keeps on feeding you, but you can't see, speak or scream. That's just that's martyrs level horror. Yeah, for for me, it was my favorite as well, because, yeah, like the idea of, you know, your torturer being the hero of your kid. Mm. Like that's the worst thing, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, once again, this is probably immigrant story. I'm gonna take it there. But the immigrants, you know, come to America. America built on slavery. What did they do in slavery? They separated the mothers and the children. Made women have children just to sell them. I mean, taught them a whole new language. Francisca is speaking to this little American boy in Portuguese. All he knows is Portuguese now. <laughs> Barely speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, you know, the mother is somewhere else chained up, literally chained up. I mean, how can I, how can you not see the parallel? You know, immigrant came to America and enslaved somebody. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, that could be it. And it could be also from the perspective of like, you know, the second generation of immigrants who were born in the country are like sort of more, how do you say that? Like they, make their parents outsiders Mm. and they alienate them. They're like, Oh, you don't know this. You don't know that. And they become like very Americanized and lose, you know, roots and things like that. So maybe also that. Are you saying that for Francisca or for the baby she kidnapped? Like the baby she kidnapped, he abandoned, not abandoned, but he doesn't know who his actual mother is. Mm, He doesn't know. He doesn't know. His actual roots. Mm, that's deep. That's deep. 
Yeah, it's uh like I said, I think this film is about immigrants who come to America and try to embody all of what America is, like the rugged individualism, doing everything by yourself, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, living in a big house on the prairie somewhere. And yeah, Francisca takes that to another level. <laughs> also yeah. the violence as well. Like she embodies that American violence, the horror that can be inflicted on other people with no regard or care. <laughs> so she's like, I'll take this to the next level. So I think this is an immigrant horror story. Right. The horror that happened to Francisca is then brought back upon uh, the people around. Right. And why does she do it? Because it feels fucking awesome. Feels great. man. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, yeah. And also about this part, I'm going to bring this, you know, thing again. Uh, like I said, in this part only, it bothered me so much. The two languages, because Francesca was talking to his son when he grew up in English. But the boy was speaking Portuguese. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the boy and speaks it Portuguese didn't make too. Sense. He, he speaks Portuguese too. He speaks Portuguese and English because when he runs out into the barn and sees this crazy woman chained up who's just hissing, he goes under the covers and says, please let it be a dream. Please let it be a dream. So he can't. Yeah, speak he speaks Portuguese. That's what I'm saying. No, but, but he, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But the mom speaks English all the time now. Uh, That's why I was like so bothered by it. Like you taught this kid Portuguese. So why are you speaking English now? Okay, but she probably taught him both just because. I mean, why not? But there is a scene where she like sits next to her son in bed and says uh, in Portuguese, like, I just want us to be together. I never want to lose you, blah, blah, blah. So she probably switches back and forth all the time. Okay, I mean, it, it felt like she was dominantly speaking English in the last part, so it sort of annoyed me, but anyway, it's a minor detail. It's a minor detail, but I think that also reflects, like, the director and the writer of this film's life, you know, growing up Brazilian-American, he probably switched back and forth in his own mind and in his family home, you know? Yeah. So, uh yeah, any other comments about this scene before we get to, like, the ending? Um, also, I just wanted to add that before Francesca went out and hitchhiked, like, this woman's, you know, car, mm -hmm. um, she was, like, having a breakdown mm -hmm. <laughs> in the woods, and she was, like, calling her mom, like, praying for her mom, saying, I miss you, I don't know what to do with my life, I don't know what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do now, like, things like that, mm -hmm. and then she just sort of went out and, you know, sort of took this woman's baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, that that was that's a crazy thing to do. But go ahead. Yeah, so basically this woman is chained up for years because the baby that Francisca kidnaps ends up becoming like I believe like a young adult, maybe 10, 11 years old, not a young adult, but like, you know, an adolescent, like preteen kid. And uh I think eventually the mother is able to escape because the boy leaves the door open. And also unchains the woman because he first gets over his fear of seeing this woman and he basically just lets her go and then runs back inside the house. Francisca is scared when she wakes up in the morning and realizes that the woman is gone and that now her time is running short. Like she'll only have so much freedom. And uh, now the movie comes full circle. We see that the woman at the beginning of the film who was walking in the streets uh and and died basically in front of the car <laughs> or passed out <clears throat> in front of the car was the uh mother who got kidnapped and so then the police come to Francisca's house she's huddled up in the corner with her uh son quote unquote <laughs> and uh she has a gun uh pointed at the door no she has a knife she has a knife in her hands the police break inside and there's just an aerial shot of the house and we hear one gunshot And uh, that's the end. So what did you think of all of those things? Yeah. Um, it was definitely like action packed the last part, I guess. But I wasn't expecting like uh, the ending to come so soon. Actually, I thought there would be more with the boy and the weird monster in the barn and Francesca a little bit. But there wasn't. And, you know, it's okay. It doesn't have to be like that. Not everything has to be too long. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was actually surprised that like sort of Francesca got like, you know, got caught 
Yeah. No, I wasn't really thinking got of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, of course. I, they call like, it ice on grass. They call it <laughs> immigration custom enforcement. Ice king. Woo, woo, we got an illegal. Wow. <laughs> got to pick up this illegal. Send them out. <laughs> but what what I was thinking in that scene is like, you know, Francesca went through something very traumatic in her childhood. Mm-hmm. And then, again, this kid that doesn't even belong to her is going to go through something very similar. Yeah. Like, first he saw this creature in the barn, he let it out, and then, uh, you know, an hours later, her mom is, like, possibly shot by a police. Yeah. And he is also going to be traumatized, and there's, like, this sort of, you know, circle, cycle that is happening uh, in this, you know, movie. In this, and so you were about to say it's society, I heard it. <laughs> No, I said circle cycle. No, circle of the circle in this society of we kill each other and the police kill us too. I think that's so chef's kiss. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> I was going to say generational trauma, but sure. Uh, generational and societal trauma. Uh, I also skipped over a scene right before the police show up. Francisca goes out into the yard where her mother is buried and picks up the body, uh, like digs a hole and like exhumes her mother's body and hugs her and says, uh, in Portuguese, I miss you, mother. I wish you were here. I wish you could meet Antonio. He's a beautiful boy. I don't want to lose him. I want us to all be a family again, all that sort of stuff. And then she runs inside. And I thought that was a touching and moving scene because it sort of brings this film back down home to just say, like, this is a girl who you know, had her family broken by violence. And, you know, she really just wants that love and affection. And she really just wants um, not to be alone in solitude. So you remember that? What did you think of that? It was very sad, but also kind of scary and gross. Mm -hmm. Because, like, her mom is now a skeleton. Yeah. So she's basically hugging, like, skeleton with some meat scraps on it. Yeah. So it's kind of gross, but yeah, it sort of brings back, okay, she's still living that trauma. Imagine and so. That, yeah, it's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, the trauma never got resolved, and it sort of led into all these things that mm-hmm. happened to her and all her behavior. Mm-hmm. And I also felt the same when, like, when she was waiting for the police to come in, mm-hmm. right? She was like shaking and screaming and saying, I'm going to protect you no matter what. She looked like a victim mm-hmm. when actually she's the perpetrator of violence, but she's also a victim too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that sort of like, just reminds me of it. Yeah. And one additional thing, if we also, again, look at the immigrant story of it, then we have like this immigrant who committed something violent uh, but does have some explanation behind it, uh-huh. but she'll never get to even explore that. And she will be seen as a monster. Mm. I mean, as she should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's like, she's also a person that needs heavy, heavy psychiatric treatment. Yes. Definitely. You know, but she's probably going to get like death row. Yeah. I think uh there's also commentary there about, you know, when you live so far away from society, you can't get help from people in society to deal with your traumas. And, you know, I think there's a critique there of that little house on the prairie lifestyle, getting away from civilization. Like, okay, you might feel like you have more freedom out there, but what if, you know, you're having issues? Who do you talk to? The trees? The cows? You know what I mean? Yeah, so. yeah, like... In this semester, for example, I'm taking a crisis counseling uh, course. And one of the first things that you do is connect the person with its community. Mm-hmm. Like that's such a healing power. And this, you know, little girl had an insane crisis. Mm-hmm. Crisis where like her mom was killed yeah. in front of her, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, she needed community and she didn't even have her father Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically yeah Yeah. so to tie it all up in a bow here's my here's my meta theory for this film francisca is the virgin mary and her father is god her father was a forgiving man an all-loving man but a distant man and a man that we can never understand because he was quiet just like god is quiet when we pray to him and talk to him because there's times when Francisca says, Father, talk to me. Father, be there for me. Father, I love you. And the father says, nothing. 
Just like if you were to say to God right now, I love you, God. God ain't going to say nothing, right? Okay. Second thing. (laughs) (laughs) Second thing. Francisca, she had sex in the film, or at least we assume she had sex. Or maybe she just laid down and cuddled with Charlie. But you can still assume that Francisca is a virgin if you really want to take it there, right? Because we never saw her physically have sex or even kiss anybody, really, I think, other than, like, Charlie when he was getting stabbed. From my recollection, the, she she kissed Kamiko, but yeah, okay, she can't she kissed get pregnant. Kimiko. I mean, uh, that don't count. <laughs> okay, because uh, it don't count if you end up chopping up a girl and putting her in the fridge. Okay, so yeah, right. <laughs> so she she never had sex, thus making her a virgin, but she still ends up becoming a mother by means that are other than pregnancy. She ends up, you know, kidnapping this woman's baby and holding her in the barn and still ends up sacrificing like everything to protect her child. Somewhat like a twisted saint, like an antichrist type of saint, if that makes sense. What if this is the real story of Mary and Jesus and it was a, you know, town story Uh and now we believe in it? I mean, it could that could also be true. (laughs) <laughs> like Mary was just that one girl who committed to her lie no matter what. And we worship her now for that. <laughs> wow. That would be insane. I, mean, I swear to God, I didn't get fucked. I swear to God, <laughs> Joseph, Here, Joseph, I swear my to, <laughs> Joseph, God got me pregnant, bro. <laughs> mm-hmm. On God, Joseph, I ain't fucked nobody. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what do you think of like the importance of eyes in this movie? Cause yeah, we see eyes quite a lot and also the lack of eyes <laughs> quite mm. a lot. Um, it's hard for me to read into that. I, I guess it is like that related to what the mother said, like everything we know comes through these things, right? And they say the eyes are windows to your soul, right? And also the eyes never lie. And, uh, you know, everybody has a different perspective. So I would say, like, you know, when she, her obsession with eyes is sort of like, you know, we're making her remember her mother, maybe possibly also being in control of these people's souls in a way by taking away their eyes, not letting them see. And, uh, you know, um, taking away their ability to lie, right? Because Charlie got into the house and killed her mother by lying, saying, I just want to talk to you. I just want to say hi, right? And, uh, yeah, by taking away the eyes, you know, the the, the things that never lie, they, the people can never lie to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. I, I was thinking about the same thing, like the eyes are the, the window to the soul. Mm-hmm. I was, like, thinking about the same thing, like when she blinded those people, she took their souls in a way and turned them into, like, animal-like creatures yeah um and uh yeah but i didn't realize like the eyes don't lie part and i think that's a good you know detail as well also you know taking away their independence right because a blind person will always be dependent on somebody and, and and have fewer reasons to leave which might be a big reason why she was like heartbroken that charlie was running away because like bitch you can't even get out of the house wait how did you get out of the house <laughs> how did charlie know how to go downstairs <laughs> i mean she he was already going so slow it was obvious that he was gonna get caught <laughs> How did he know which direction is north? Like <laughs> <laughs> he was just going wherever. Like everywhere is better than there. I guess so. I mean, yeah. But uh, yeah, overall, uh, I give this film give it a solid seven. Give it a solid seven. It's uh, not a groundbreaking horror film. It's like a novella. You know what I mean? It's like a very good short novel of like a hundred pages. You know? Would you rather this movie be colored other than black and white? I thought the black and white was fine. I didn't yeah. have any problem with the black and white. I thought it uh, built on the mystique of the film, the aesthetic. Uh, the shots in this thing are beautiful, right? It's a beautifully shot film, well-executed film, a horror film without jump scares, and it's not cheap. Uh, it works on the mind. It's not anything revolutionary, though. And yeah. uh, it's not unforgettable, but it's not super rememberable. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, I would agree with that. I like the black and white as well. It adds like nostalgia to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of like gives the bit of a more romantic vibe to the movie, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like I know like there's gore in this movie where and you feel very uncomfortable, but also like some of the shots are very romantic. Yeah. Um, it like, uh, not in the love shots type of way, but just like the style of it is romantic. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I think I would give it like a seven as well. You know, yeah. I'm going to agree with you on this one. Yeah. Yeah. You could build on it more like my theory that they're immigrants or that the guy's a warlord running away from his problems in Portugal. <laughs> and so he settled in like Wisconsin in the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah, but, uh, that was definitely a perspective I did not think about. So, like, thank you for that. And I think that made it more enjoyable for me. Because uh, yeah. what I thought, I mean, it is like a trauma story. Yeah, it's sort of an empty story that you can fill in with. You can fill in the blanks with what you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I uh, think that's it. Shall we wrap it up? Yeah. All right. Well, this has been episode 90 of Simon and Acting Movie Reviews, The Eyes of My Mother, 2016 horror film, Nicholas Teche, director. And if you have any other films you want us to review, put them in the comments, put it in the chat. We will try to get to it. Uh, shout out to my guy, Nelson Moreno. We have Ghost in the Shell, a film that he requested a few weeks ago that we're going to review, and that will be coming up soon. Also, a bunch of other movies we watched during our little mini break. And uh, y'all be easy out there. Peace.